All right. Hello. Good to be with you all again. It is Saturday morning, January the 23rd. It is pouring rain outside. And so I figured, hey, what better time to record a lecture? Go in my little recording studio here and drop down a track about World War I. That's what I'm doing right now. All right. So we are in um, semester two. We're getting into unit five getting very near the end of the class and we're you know we're in the 20th century now folks so this is the stuff that students tend to really identify with this we're we're emerging into an america that you could recognize now if you guys went back you know 100 105 years to the 19 teens uh, I mentioned this in other lectures that you would see Wrigley chewing gum coca-cola levi jeans um, you'd see department stores that don't look too different than the ones today, although I think Amazon's probably going to put out uh, department stores out of business uh, in another decade or two. But um, those existed, A and P grocery stores in every town. It was, you know, America being the superpower that it is today, um, third or fourth biggest navy in the world, um, and and having an overseas presence throughout the Pacific and Latin America. The Panama Canal was opened at this point. This is the emerging modern America that you guys, you know, could identify with and recognize. This is a picture of good old Uncle Sam. If you guys don't know, Uncle Sam's not a real person. He's um, a symbol, essentially. He was a creation of uh, essentially American propaganda. Um, the Committee on Public Information, which was founded during World War I, painted a lot of posters and these posters were mass produced and put in every street corner everywhere in America. Uh, World War I is, it's not the first total war in American history, really the Civil War. You could argue in some ways the revolution was too, but they didn't have modern banking and mobilization practices. You know, you probably hear now the Defense Production Act, Biden should uh, invoke the Defense Production Act. If you don't know what that means, this was a law passed during the um, Korean War that basically said in, uh, in a time of war, in a time of national crisis, we can't go to businesses and say, hey, would you like to produce tanks for us? It would be really nice, gee whiz, please. What if they don't want to? What if they don't like the price that you wanna buy them at? What if they don't wanna cooperate? Under these emergency measures, the government can just seize factories, convert them, and then run them as they see fit. To a lesser extent, they could just force businesses to do it. You stay put, Henry Ford, you're going to keep making us these tanks. Uh, you're going to retain ownership, but we are going to force you. And if you don't, the army is going to come in and, and at gunpoint make you do all this. So there's arguments that today we need to do this for vaccine development and distribution because ordinary forces of supply and demand just aren't cutting it. So there's that. In World War I, we're going to have to produce tanks and you know ships and all kinds of good stuff, gas masks, boots. We're gonna to have to mass produce food for all these millions of soldiers, but also we're gonna to have to have a draft because not everybody's going to want to sign up for this war who we need. And you know, we need a little gentle nudging to those who might be on the fence. So these pictures were everywhere in America. I want you to enlist, join the army, go to your nearest recruiter station. Uncle Sam outlives the war because there's no reason to make these posters after the war is done, but his image was so popular artists were so good at creating it that he becomes the personification of America. Even to this day, we use the term Uncle Sam to refer to the federal government. Um, and, uh, and, and there's no coincidence that it's Uncle Sam, his initials are US, United States. Some of you are like, oh, mind blown, right? I never knew that before. So that's who that guy is, if you ever uh, were wondering about that. Okay, so, um, Real quick, a uh, quick overview of the start of World War One. It's actually not all that important for this class for our purposes. Um, understand this is still the US that is an isolationist country. Now we spent a lot of time saying that we're very much involved in global affairs. We're very much involved in the affairs of North and South America, the Caribbean and the Pacific. That's it. Uh, the U.S. had no interest in Europe, Africa, or Asia, because Europe is a very strong continent with a lot of strong imperial nations. Africa and Asia basically are the uh, colonial possessions of those nations, which we didn't dare, you know, try to mess with and spark a war. Um, so 
why Serbia went to war with Austria-Hungary in 1914 doesn't really matter to us. Most Americans couldn't tell you why that war broke out. Most Americans couldn't find Serbia on a map. Most Americans are very unconcerned with this conflict as it broke out. Most Americans just sort of said, oh, well, that peace that started with, you know, the fall of Napoleon in 1815 took 100 years, but finally Europe's back to their old ways. These old empires just have war after war after war. And we were just uninterested by it. That's the mainstream American opinion. Um, now, there are some, um, like Theodore Roosevelt in the Republican Party, who kind of felt that we had just become a major power player and the powers of Europe and Japan especially would not respect us unless we got in on this war. This is a weird inversion of, of the stories you probably heard your grandfather tell you about the 60s, right? In the 1960s when Vietnam was going on, when my father was serving, um, young men would go to Canada to get out of the war because Canada was not involved in that conflict. And so you had tens of thousands of Americans. And I love this story, by the way, right? Americans are so lazy. They're like, eh, let's go to America Junior. I don't even have to learn a foreign language. <laughs> you can use American currency in Canada, why not? And so they, you know, they don't go to Mexico where it'd be a challenge, they go to Canada. Um, in World War I, Americans would sneak across the border to Canada to enlist. There were a lot of young men, believe it or not, um, who were very pro-British who said, you know, I want to get in on this war and we're neutral, so I'm going to cross the border and enlist in Toronto and then I can go fight those Germans, right? There were some with that sentiment, there were some like Theodore Roosevelt, but the wide swath of American public opinion was, even if my sympathies are with the British and the French, it's not our fight. Stay out of it. Stay out of it as much as possible. Our president, Woodrow Wilson, was elected in 1912 and had announced when the war broke out, let's stay out of this. And there's really a couple of reasons for this. Number one is that really the, the strong core of democratic support in the North was immigrant, right? Like this still was a democratic party who the white South was solidly democratic and African-Americans were not allowed to vote at this time under the Jim Crow system. So the white South was the white South. It was solidly democratic. And in the North, it was Irish, Italians, Germans, et cetera, immigrant groups from Europe uh, who were the core of that party. Now, I think you all can probably understand that being a hyphenated American, you have sort of this dual identity, right? If you're Italian American, you love America, but you have a lot of family ties. You have still a lot of family members left in the old country. And when the war broke out, the Italians were actually on Germany's side for a year. Okay. Uh, my little spiel about this is never go to war if the Italians are your allies because they switch sides in both world wars, which is wonderful, right? They started out on the side of Germany and in both world wars when it, the going got tough, they said, just kidding, we're going to switch sides. This is what my kid does in Mario Kart when I start beating him. Like normally he can beat me every time, but in the rare case where I surge ahead of him, he says, daddy, let's switch remotes. And I'm like, okay, now you'll never lose because you just, you know, if I beat you, we switch controllers. If you beat me, then, you know, you beat me. This is what the Italians do. Um, so if you're Italian American and you're inside the Germany, you're very torn, right? You're like, well, you know, America seems to be tilting towards the British and favoring, you know, that old waspy culture, but Italy is on the other side. I'm conflicted. Likewise, the largest immigrant group in America historically was German Americans. There were 8 million German Americans. This is when the country had uh, about 100, 110 million people, 10% nearly, right? 8, 9% of uh, the US population was ethnically German. You guys get why German Americans don't want to go to war with Germany? Man, that would make family reunions pretty awkward, right? It's like, oh, well, we're having our family reunion in Dusseldorf this year. Thanks for coming. Uh, Fritz, It's this is really awkward. Dieter and Hans and Horace aren't here because you killed them on the battlefield. That was really harsh and awkward, you know. Then people lose their appetite, appetite for, you know, Frankfurters and sauerkraut, right? You're not going to get out the lederhosen and the accordion and dance after dinner like you normally would. Sorry, these stereotypes are funny to me. So um, German-Americans dead set against this war. Um, 
British propaganda was very nasty about the Germans, saying that the Germans were subhuman, that they were barbarians, that they were Huns. Huns is the term that really stuck because the Huns are barbarians that sacked and destroyed Rome in the fifth century and destroyed Western civilization for a thousand years. And that's the argument. The Germans started to invade France in 1914. And the argument was if we don't go and help them, then they will overrun the Champs-Élysées, take over Paris, this beautiful, wonderful Western country, and the barbarians will have sacked Rome again, and Europe will sink into the Dark Ages for another thousand years. This was a ridiculous argument. This was the Germany of Wagner. If you guys know Rick, Richard Wagner, great composer of the late 19th, early 20th century, this was the um, Germany of Hegel uh, and uh, his philosophies. Um, it was the Germany of these wonderful scientific discoveries. Um, so it was ridiculous to say that they were barbarians or unsophisticated. Germany, in a lot of ways, had the best schools in the world, uh, the best um, art in the world. Uh, they really were a very sophisticated civilization. Now, it is true they're not quite a democracy at the time, um, but they were sort of a half democracy. They had a, a parliament a Reichstag, but they also had an emperor and then they had really a strong military that had a lot of say in stuff. So they're not democratic as much as the US or Britain or France at the time. But to say that they were barbarians and evil, German Americans just said, that's ridiculous. Also, there were 4 million Irish Americans in the US at the time who were even more anti-war than German Americans. So you got 12 million people right there and understand that that's, that's the core of the Democratic Party right there. It probably represented a third to half of all Democratic votes were just those two ethnic groups. Now, why do the Irish not wanna get involved in this war? If you guys don't know, the Irish, um, their entire existence is wrapped up in the fact that the British colonized and dominated them for 700 years from the 1300s until the, the middle of the 1900s until the 20th century. Um, and they hated the British. They hate the British. I remember going into a British pub when I was like 21, 22. And they, it was a huge British pub in New York City. And they had flags from every country on earth there except the Union Jack. You could not find the British flag anywhere. And I commented on this and they said, you know, they scoffed. They said, Great Britain, there ain't nothing great about that place, right? They still hold a grudge. Now, in 1914, Ireland was not even a country yet. It had not gained its independence from Great Britain. It was part of the British Empire. Irish people were not treated as citizens. Lots of hard feelings from uh, those six, 700 years plus the, the potato famine. Their one thought in international diplomacy is we hate the British. And Irish Americans were even more militant because they were far enough away from Britain to actually voice these concerns. So, as you might imagine, Woodrow Wilson said, I can't get involved in this war. I'm going to lose re-election, right? 1916 is real close. If I plunge us into war, I'm going to lose my base and the Republicans are going to win. So Woodrow Wilson tried his darndest to keep us out of this war. He had a lot of great speeches saying, uh, this is not weak. This is not cowardice. This is bravery and strength. Sometimes it takes more bravery to stay out of a conflict than to get mired in it. I think those are great words. Um, the fascinating thing is that uh, Woodrow Wilson gets reelected in 1916 and his platform is he kept us out of war. Posters are made in the millions and put all over the country. He kept us out of war. The Republican Charles Evans Hughes, another one of these great Americans that has a school named after him in Long Beach, Hughes Middle School, Charles Evans Hughes. Um, Hughes was chief justice of the Supreme Court. He resigned so that he could run for president. He very nearly defeated Woodrow Wilson but his rhetoric was very much, we need to get involved in this conflict. The British and French are on the verge of disaster. If we don't bail them out, the Germans will dominate Europe and the world, and we don't want that. We have this nice cozy relationship with Britain where we speak the same language, have a very similar culture, legal system, political system, et cetera, and they run the world. And it's very nice that we kind of get some of that rubbed off on us. So um, Hughes does not win, but as soon as Woodrow Wilson is re-inaugurated in March of 1917. One month later, the US declared war on Germany. How could that have happened when he was so strongly against it? Well, a couple of things. Number one, um, although we were officially neutral, 
trade with the allies skyrockets in the war and trade with Germany absolutely plunges. Now this is, there's various reasons for this. Um, part of it is insurance. It was a lot more dangerous uh, statistically to trade with um, Germany than it was with Great Britain. Germany was using mines and minefields um, whereas the British were using kind of an old school blockade system. It was easier to continue trade with Britain. It was closer. It was very hard to try to trade with Germany. So insurance companies rates went through the roof if you had cargo bound for Hamburg or, or um, Danzig during this time. Those are German ports in the North and, and Baltic seas. So <clears throat> that's one reason is that just insurance rates made it too expensive. Uh, second is that the wealthy of the uh, US were still largely white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who had a strong affinity for Great Britain. There's Again, there's this weird thing I think I talked about in the last lecture where the elite of America, pretty much what happened was all these new immigrants coming in awakened in America a sort of ancient ethnicity. Most Americans didn't think of themselves as transplanted British people in the 1870s and 1880s. But when faced with new immigrants, a lot of Americans said, these Italians, Slovenes, Poles, Jews from Russia, I, a waspy Protestant from America, Bill Johnson, have much more in common with British people today in Britain than I do with these people. Um, and so there was a strong affinity that started to be built in. Very strangely, on, Wall, uh, or on um, Broadway in New York City, Americans would go and see British plays and British operas. There was a very famous... Um, musical duo Gilbert and Sullivan, who wrote dozens of plays in the 1870s, and these caught on like wildfire in America. Uh, if you ever heard of the Pirates of Penzance or the HMS Pinafore, these are very famous operas in 1878, 1879. And they're all about being in the British Navy and honor to the queen and all this stuff. And it's very weird. Americans have an absolute fascination with this, waspy Protestant Americans. And that translated into the Rockefellers and the Carnegies, and especially the JP Morgans. These countries at war were borrowing money like crazy. And JP Morgan just flat out said, I'm not loaning a penny to the Germans. They're barbarians. They're terrible people. I'm going to open my wallet for the British and the French. And he controlled the banking system in America. So he loaned hundreds of millions of dollars to the Allies, whereas loans and trade with Germany and Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire and Italy just dropped off a cliff. So um, why does this eventually get us sucked into a war? Um, two reasons mainly. Um, so first, you had this practice known as unrestricted submarine warfare. That's what the Germans were doing. By 1915, it seemed pretty clear that this war, World War I, was not going to end like the Franco-Prussian War or the Crimean, where the victorious, or, or the Mexican War, um, where the victorious army marches into its enemy's capital, surrounds it, and says, game over, we win. That was not going to happen this time around, because World War I took time, it, it, it took place at a time when the firepower of war had surged forward. There were tremendously powerful rifles and munitions and, and everything created uh, in World War I, but they still could not propel that firepower forward, meaning you could build cannons that were unbelievably strong, but you, there were no internal combustion engines that could haul and propel those. So you were using horses to slowly drag these artillery places, uh, pieces into place. The tank is invented in World War I, but they were incredibly slow. They were so heavily armored that, and the engines so primitive at that time, the top speed of most tanks was one and a half miles per hour. So it was like the British unleashed the first round of tanks in a battle in 1916 and the Germans could see these giant behemoths slowly rolling towards them. And it was like, hey, we better get moving, digging trenches. They'll be here in an hour or two. And then the German army would get out and just dig these really long trenches and the tanks would just fall right into them. So they were practically useless. That meant the defensive had the advantage. You would just dig a trench, wait, and your enemy would attack you, and you could repel, repel them. Taking land in an attack was suicidal. And so this was realized very early on in World War I, where both sides kind of just dug trenches, sat in, and waited for their opponents to attack them. Um, and this led to an absolute slaughter. And it seemed like 
every country was being bled white. They're, they were running out of young men to fight. They were running out of money. They were running out of weapons, but they had to keep it up because whoever quit first was going to lose. You had to keep borrowing, keep this up. And it dawned on both belligerents, both sides of this war that whoever was going to win was going to starve and to surrender its end, right? The, the other side needs to run out of men, it needs to run out of bullets, it needs to run out of money or run out of food. And the other side would win. So the British started implementing a blockade. They said, hey, you know, this is wartime. This has been done for several hundred years, but whoever wants to try to trade with Great Britain, we're going to stop you. So the British sent its navy out all over the oceans. Britain was blessed with much better geography for trade. They're an island, so there's multiple entry and exit points. Germany really is landlocked except for two little coasts, again, one in the Baltic, one in the North Sea, which can be bottled up very easily. The distance between Norway and Britain is only like 100 miles or so. And you could just blanket that area with the British fleet and stop everyone from trading with Germany. Um, and so uh, the British um, set up minefields all over the North Sea and all over the Baltic Sea, and they patrolled the way they did in the past, right? Is it, I think you remember, I hope, back in the 1790s when the French did this to us in the Quasi War. Um, if you're running a blockade, basically what you do is you patrol the oceans, you announce to merchant vessels who you are, you holler at them through a big bullhorn and say, this is the British Navy, you're going to be commandeered. We're going to search your cargo for anything bound for Germany. The ship lets you on. You search. You seize anything bound for Germany. If not, you let it go. Um, but you always have to announce that you're doing that. The Germans decided in the late 19th and early 20th century to build a huge fleet, but they were so behind Britain in terms of their navy that they said, well, we could never catch up in like conventional ships. We're not going to build battleships and dreadnoughts and all these ships. There's this new naval weapon known as the submarine. U-boats is what they referred to them as. That's for Unterwasserboot. I love German. They, it's so technical, right? Unterwasserboot, underwater boat. Not very beautiful submarine conjures back this old, you know, um, time uh, of uh, mariners going over the high seas and whatnot. Um, so the Germans invent this submarine and they say, you know, the, the, the hull of the ship is very thin. It can be punctured very easily. It's not like sinking a battleship where it might take two or three or four torpedoes. Like one simple hit at the hull will sink the whole submarine. So you give away the whole game when you surface and you warn your opponent, hey, you know, we're going to commandeer your ship. What the Germans started to do was without warning, just fire torpedoes and sink any merchant vessel bound for Great Britain. Now, um, this is where traditions come in. The British basically invented the blockade system, had been doing it for 200 years and said, this violates the rules of warfare. There's rules even in war, and it just seemed that this was dastardly, cowardly, evil, in a word, German. They have no compunction about just murdering civilians innocently just for trading with the enemy, and it's just against the rules. It was sort of like the Navy, like the HMS Pinafore and, and Pirates of Penzance. When you watch those plays, it was like there was honor, dignity, and glory in the British Navy. And this was the most dastardly, cowardly thing imaginable. Unrestricted submarine warfare. It's just terrible. But the Germans felt, we have a great army, but our Navy isn't as good. We're not going to fight according to British rules. We're going to invent this new modern, you know, rules change. It's a new rule of modern warfare. Americans didn't buy into it. We bought into the British propaganda that said this was just terrible. And honestly, it was. It interfered with our ability to trade with whom we wanted to. However, the Germans did have a bit of a point, which is that the, the British were doing similar things with their minefields all over the North Sea. Lots of American ships would get blown up without warning there. But it was this weird thought that, well, that wasn't a conscious decision of the mine to blow up a ship. It was unfortunate accident, although we placed the mines there. Whereas the Germans, it's a human making the decision to shoot. Sort of a ridiculous distinction without a difference, but such was the nature of American foreign policy. Woodrow Wilson lost his mind over unrestricted submarine warfare and issued a lot of threats. This came to a head in 1915 over the sinking of the Lusitania. The Lusitania was a British cruise liner you know, like if you just got on a princess cruise ship in Long Beach Harbor and was heading down to Mexico and some other power shot and 
blew it up, right? Venezuela doesn't like us. Let's imagine Venezuela sank a British or American cruise liner on the high seas, you know, tourists on holiday. Now, ever since the Germans had argued that the Lusitania was actually smuggling arms, weapons, that they had intelligence about that, and that they did sink it without warning. Um, the Lusitania was indeed smuggling weapons, but that's really not the point. The point was that you're not supposed to shoot it without warning. When the Germans did this, they killed over a thousand civilians and 128 of them were Americans who had gone to Britain on holiday. Now, why you would go to Britain on holiday when they're in a state of war I, and you know that Germans are sinking ships, I don't know, but people did it, were killed and Woodrow Wilson was livid that 128 Americans were killed. Imagine today if people were on a cruise liner or uh, a passenger plane and it was shot out of the sky by Iran or North Korea, there'd be hell to pay for that. So Germany backed off. They apologized for this incident and they said, okay, at first they tried to defend it saying that they were smuggling weapons and then they backed off when Wilson said, we're gonna go to war if you don't stop. And they said, okay, we're gonna stop. Now, two years later, Germany was on the verge of starving to death, the, the huge portions of their population. The British blockade was working, the German blockade was not. And so the Germans started to feel we're winning the land war where the whole war was fought in Belgium and France. Not a single shot was fired on German territory. Their army did very well on the battlefield, but because of naval trade, because of the British Navy and because of just bad geography, Germany was gonna lose this because their people were on the verge of starving and they wanted to end the war. This is known as the cabbage winter uh, because there was nothing to eat in Germany except for a few rations, people would eat cabbage. You hear these horrible stories of German mothers telling their children to go back in the forest and chip bark off of trees so that they could just boil it in a big pot of soup so that you could have something to fill up your stomachs with. And so the German high command finally said, we have to break this deadlock. We're never going to march in on Paris, but our army's doing great. We have to win the naval war. We have to break this blockade. So we're starting again. They announced it to the world in February of 1917. They said, we're starting again, unrestricted submarine warfare. We're going to shoot any ship without warning that's bound for Great Britain. And they started doing it again, sinking actual American merchant vessels, killing American sailors and, uh, and, destroying American cargo and interfering with our ability to trade. Now that alone might have gotten us involved in the war, it probably would have after a while, after the accumulation of this over several months. But then the Germans did something very foolish. They raised the stakes and they escalated. Once they announced unrestricted submarine warfare in February of 1917, they then realized um, it was just a matter of time. America was gonna declare war at some point. And so they felt you know, it took a while for these countries to mobilize. Germany, France, Great Britain, they weren't able to mobilize immediately. And most of them had standing armies that were very large before the war. Germany had the largest standing army in the history of the world. They had a million men in the army waiting for their tag, waiting for the day that Germany would go to war and get its place at the table with all these other great countries. And America did not have a great standing army. So the Germans imagine it would take us a year or more to fully mobilize, have a draft, build up a big army, convert our factories to production. And by the time that we did that, it wouldn't even make a difference. They would start a final surge on Paris in 1917 that would culminate in 1918 and they would win. That was their estimation. Now, if America does start sending troops to Europe, we would like to tie them down in their own backyard. So Germany did something very foolish. They reached out to Mexico in 1917 and asked for an alliance. Now they did this secretly, but it was the secret message was captured by the British, decoded, and then released to the American press. This is a cartoon at the time of this arrangement. It's known as the Zimmerman telegram pretty racist cartoon, but it's 100 years ago, and that's the way it was. But the idea here, this is the German Kaiser, this is the German emperor with the spiky helmet, and he's whispering in the ear of a Mexican guy. Can you tell he's Mexican with his big sombrero, and he's got like a serape on and everything. And there's a little note that the Kaiser is showing him that says, join with Germany, and you get a bit of the United States. The Zimmerman telegram sent to the Mexican government essentially said, hey, we're Germany, we're at war with uh, 
Britain and France right now, America is going to declare war on us very soon, we think, because unrestricted submarine warfare. If America declares war on us, Germany, we want you, Mexico, to go to war with America. So that'll tie down American troops in its own backyard. Just the previous year in 1916, the US invaded Mexico with the authorization of President Carranza, who wanted our help to hunt down Pancho Villa. General Pershing marched around the deserts of Sonora and Chihuahua for over a year and could not find him. He became a huge folk hero. So we withdrew. So there was a lot of bad feelings there. The Mexican government was friendly with the US, but a lot of the Mexican people did not like the US very much. And so there was some sentiment in Mexico to jump in on this, to make an alliance with Germany. The Mexican government felt this is the most ridiculous thing ever. We're never going to do this. Make a war. Last time we made war in America, they took half our country. Plus, Mexico was in no position to declare war on the US. They were in the middle of a civil war. Mexico was thrown into revolution in 1910, and things would not calm down till the easy or early 1920s. They were in the middle of this bitter fight and struggle. Um, as I said, Pancho Villa controlled several of these northern states. There were other rebels that controlled other parts. It was insane to offer this, and, and they got caught. The British intercepted the message. They released it to the New York Times, and on the front page of every newspaper in America was the actual text of the Zimmerman telegram, and Americans were livid, just that the treacherous Germans would A, sink our ships without warning, how dastardly, how cowardly, and B, make an alliance with Mexico against us a clear violation of the Monroe Doctrine. Remember the Monroe Doctrine, 1823? No European power can try to invade or influence our hemisphere. This was almost 100 years later, 1917. And finally, America has the power and the backbone to actually back this up and say, no, you will not do this. No one makes an alliance with our neighbors against us. We're going to go to war with you. So in April of 1917, Woodrow Wilson goes to the Congress and he says, we need to declare war on Germany. It's a very interesting speech. If you go and read the text of it, he gives a lot of reasons why we have to do this. But one thing you have to note about America, we're an incredibly optimistic country. We really are. If you talk to foreigners about their impressions of America and Americans, one thing they say is Americans are incredibly polite, always willing to talk to you. Like when foreign journalists come to America and they want to interview people, they're like, usually if you go to people in Britain and France, nobody wants to talk to you. But in America, it's like, sure, come on, sit down, have a spot at the table. You know, we're very hospitable and we're incredibly optimistic. If you look at our movies, if you look at, you know, our art, it's always has a happy ending, very nearly always. Europeans are much more cynical than we are. They're very pessimistic about stuff. By 1916, all the war enthusiasm in Europe had just evaporated. Um, in 1914, people, there hadn't been a major war in Europe in a hundred years. So young men went and signed up. They wanted to be brave and valiant. All these great poems from the romantic era, um, like the charge of the light brigade, half a league, half a league, half a league onward. Theirs is not but to reason why, theirs is but to do and die, right? The glory of a soldier marching into battle for his country. Uh, Europeans had not seen war in a long time. Now the Americans had had the Civil War and you know, we're still kind of colored by that. And um, when we do go to war, Americans want a good reason. We don't wanna hear, well, this is good for our security. And we wanna know we're Superman and we're saving the world from great danger. So that's what Woodrow Wilson did. He took a war that was started for very cynical power reasons uh, which Europeans admitted, they basically said, this is a war to protect the British, French, and German empires from our enemies. Americans said, no, 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 this is a war, number one, to make the world safe for democracy, that there's these evil forces in the world like Germany that are trying to extinguish the light of democracy and civilization, which this is barely half true. Um, first, the Germans were very... Uh, proud to note that the British, French, and Americans had no qualms holding hands with the Russians in this war at all. Russia, this is pre-Soviet Russia. This is czarist Russia. This is, the, this is the Russia of Jewish pogroms. This is when Russian soldiers would march into Jewish villages in the Pale of Settlement and just burn down villages, murder people, 
rape, pillage, do unspeakable actions. There's a reason why a million Jews fled Russia and went to America from the 1880s to the 19 teens. It was a horrible place to live. It was a, probably the least free place in the world at that time. And Germans were looking at us saying, make the world safe for democracy. Did you tell the Russians that's what this war was all about? That's ridiculous. Much like in World War II, the US and Britain and France cozied up to Russia because they were a powerful nation and they feared the Germans more. It was just a cynical power play. You, 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 there's a wonderful Arab saying that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It doesn't matter what your internal politics are. If you and I hate the same country, we can be friends. And countries do this. They, they make deals with devils all the time. And we were holding hands with czarist Russia here. This would change in the middle of the war. There'd be a revolution, but the new government wouldn't really be any better. It would be the, the Bolsheviks. And in some ways, they were even worse. Um, but the US and Britain and France embraced them and said, no, 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 it's still about making the world safe for democracy. Germany was kind of in between the two extremes. They weren't as free as Britain, France, or America, but they weren't as totalitarian as Russia. Um, second, I love this. Woodrow Wilson said, this is not a war against any one country. This is a war against war. We're going to make war against war. This is the war to end all wars. I never understood that when I heard that as a kid. I knew that you can't call it World War I at the time. Nobody knew there'd be a sequel yet. So no one called it World War I when it broke out. People called it the Great War. Other people called it the War to End War because Woodrow Wilson announced once the peace comes around, we're going to make a treaty that will end war forever. And boy, they really did, right? Oh, oops. Yeah, we would have World War II and then all these other wars afterwards. But dang it, you know, Americans want a good reason to go to war. We want to feel like we're the good guys, we're Superman saving the world. And so this was told to the Congress and told to the American people. So men like this went down and signed up and they went off to France and Belgium to go save the world. Um, there's a wonderful propaganda song uh, that was made during World War I and it's called Over There, which is the title of the slide, right? Um, Technology had just been invented that allowed you to finally record sound and play it back. And so this invention took off in 1915, 16, and 17. This is known as the phonograph. You've probably seen old pictures where it's like a record player that would spin around and you had the, these you know, discs that you could put on it. And there were little grooves in it where you would stick a needle and it would amplify the sound through like a horn. And so people bought this. So this is the first time in human history where someone could record a song and you could go and buy that and play it, which was amazing, right? I, and again, I know today you're like, dude, you have to walk down to a store. Yes, when I was a kid in the 90s, we had to walk down to music stores and buy our CDs and our cassette tapes. It's amazing now that you can do this all on your phone, just instantaneously get any song in the world. Um, but it blew people's minds that they could now buy records. And one of the very first big hits in all of world history was over there. It was a great propaganda song commissioned in 1917. The lyrics go, Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Go and kill the Hun. You're a son of a gun. And there, you know, it continues like that, essentially, demonizing the Germans. And, and I love the refrain, the chorus at the end says, over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there that the Yanks are coming. Okay, as if to say, send the word to France and Britain, America's coming, the cavalry's coming and we're gonna save everything. America's just going to make everything a-okay. And this song was huge. It filled Americans with pride that we were this sort of wonderful police force of the world and we were gonna save the good guys. So Americans willingly went down and signed up and went off. The Germans are making an alliance with Mexico. They're sinking our ships. Those evil people have to be stopped. So we imbibed all of the, the propaganda. Posters in America would be depicting Germans as these sort of vampire-like figures with long fangs, blood dripping from them, usually with the French or Belgian woman across their shoulder to be taken back to Germany for purposes better imagined than described. Uh, this was how Germans were depicted all over, these shadowy, evil, beast-like figures. And we believed we were fighting evil and standing up for good.
most British and French people did not op operate under those illusions by that time. So um, we don't really need to talk very much about the actual battles. They're not that important. Amazingly, and this may surprise you, this is one of the few times in American history where Americans served under foreign leaders, meaning basically we sent an army to France and put General Foch in charge and just said, you use them as you see fit. The reverse would be true in the Second World War when General Eisenhower controlled all of the soldiers on the Western Front. So all of British and you know French and Polish soldiers that fought on D-Day, they served under an American commander. This was the reverse. This was their war and we were a junior partner. They had been at war for nearly three years at that point. And so we just gave them a lot of soldiers and said, use them as you see fit. Um, they're not involved in too many engagements that actually turn the tide of the war. What really America adds more than anything else is number one, money. We were the richest country on earth by this time. Britain and France had bankrupted themselves fighting this war. America came with a huge injection of capital and said, here's the money. And that really lifted their ability to be able to fight because they, they, their will and their spirit was broken by this time, which leads us to the second point, and that's morale. Morale means your sort of fighting spirit right, the, the sort of belief in yourself, so to speak, it's sort of the confidence of a nation, right? That's why we do these surveys every year where you guys answer these ridiculous 65 question surveys. I feel safe in the halls, I feel safe in the bathroom, et cetera. The, what that is, is it's a morale survey basically. And interestingly, Millikan has very high morale. We, you see the ones from Polly and, and Jordan and Cabrillo and especially Lakewood, right? Morale is not as high at those, uh, at those sites, which is very interesting. You know, Millikan, we have a lot of school spirit and people are proud and honored to work and, and, and teach and, and learn at Millikan. Um, in Europe, the French morale, or as they call it, elan, sort of their fighting spirit, it had been broken by this time. Morale is sort of the intangible in war. It's rather astonishing that some countries can fight against the odds like the Vietnamese during, you know, the Viet Cong during the Vietnam War were way outgunned and outmanned and they still had this fighting spirit that they weren't gonna give in, right? The Taliban in Afghanistan, evil people, but man, they just won't give up no matter what. They've been fighting since the 1970s, you know, basically to dominate that country. The US really lifted the spirit of the French and the British and they basically saw troop load after troop load landing on the on the European continent and they just said oh thank god this is great now we can fight now we can continue on um there's this wonderful story that the first commander that stepped off the first transport in 1917 was ordered and did say the phrase Lafayette we have landed which was a hearkening back to this wonderful alliance the American uh, and French alliance of the Revolutionary War. If you remember Lafayette from the musical Hamilton, he was this young military officer that Louis XVI sent to the US in 1778, and he trained Washington and these other soldiers in the ways of war. It's linking together the American Revolution and the French Revolution and this, this friendship. Remember, our oldest ally is not Britain, it's not Canada, it is France. Now, we turned our backs on them during the quasi war and during, you know, the, the uh, Napoleonic Wars, but this was the payback. It was sort of like, hey, uh, 130 years ago, you helped us out. Now we're back and now we're here to save you. You helped us found our democracy. We're going to help save yours. Okay, well, maybe a little late, but, you know, not too late because we would bail France out at, at their moment of need. Um, by the way, Americans always like to brag about this too. We always like to throw it in the face of the French and the British that, hey, we saved your butts twice, right? In World War I and World War II. You'd be speaking German now if it wasn't for us. Don't ever remind the French of that. They don't like being reminded of it. And second, if it weren't for them, we wouldn't even be a country. We'd be like Canada now, right? Some old British colony that they just let go in the 19th century rather than our great struggle and our wonderful revolutionary history. So this cemented this alliance and forever after um, France would be a valuable ally. They're still an ally of ours in NATO and, and we have this strong alliance. So um, the war ends in November of 1918 and America is victorious with the morale that we bring, with the money that we bring, 
um, Germany realized it was just a fool's errand. They were fighting Russia in the East. Now they finally do win the war against Russia in March of 1918. And they gain a lot of territory there, but that treaty would be abrogated. It would be overturned when the Germans finally surrendered in 1918 uh, in November. And then the Treaty of Versailles would obliterate the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which was signed in the East. Um, so let's talk about the effects on the home front because that's really the most important thing. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the effects on, on GIs, on soldiers that went to Europe, because it was an interesting experience for them. And there were some three or four million of them that served. And it, and it was a big shaping experience for that generation. Um, but more important was the effect here. Now, first, this was a huge boon to the economy. War always is. The United States raised some $56 billion, billion with a B, for World War I only spending 14 and a half billion of it. We raised more money than we actually needed. That's how awesome we are. The great uh, economist and banker Bernard Baruch was put in charge of all war contracts and he went out to men like Henry Ford and said, Henry, you're making this great Model T, but we need you to start making tanks and ships and other materials for us. He went to, you know, clothing manufacturers and said, you're gonna make us the uniforms. He went to other manufacturers and said, you're gonna make the gas masks. And he was the one that took the money and then spent it on those contracts. And he did a very good job at it. Um, now, we had to raise the money as well. Governments raise money in two ways. Number one, taxing. So taxes went up. The very new income tax that had just come around in 1913 was raised in 1917. Or rather, it's more accurate to say the exemptions were lowered, meaning it used to be people had to make over $3,000 a year to pay the income tax. You made under 3,000, you didn't have to pay it, which was a lot of money back then. Um, the average American didn't pay any income tax. And this was lowered to $1,000 a year. So nearly everybody in America was now paying into the pot and that raised some um, $23 billion just that income tax. That alone would have won us World War I. But beyond that, women's groups like the WCTU and the YWCA, women went out on street corners, um, stood in front of posters like this with their son's Boy Scout troop and sold Liberty bonds. A bond is essentially when the government borrows money. So what, what they do basically is they say, hey, give us 50 or hundred bucks, whatever it is, we're gonna give you a certificate and that certificate has a maturity date, right? Like you're buying a, a bond in 1917, they say, you know, here you go, come back in five years in 1922, and you can cash in that $50 bond for $75 or $100 or whatever it is, right? Different bonds have different interest rates. Absolutely guaranteed by Uncle Sam, meaning if there is a federal government in five years, you will get your money back. That's why people loan the US government money buying treasury bonds or what are often called T-bills because they're the absolute safest investment. It doesn't have the best rate of return, but it's better than a savings account and it's absolutely guaranteed. It's not like putting your money in a bank and what, is, what if the bank fails, does it have insurance? As long as there's a United States of America, you'll get your money back, which is a pretty safe bet. And so women went out and did that and they raised $33 billion doing this. And of course, they used one of the great motivating factors in human history, they used guilt, right? Is that people would walk out of their A&P grocery store and you would holler at them. You'd say, hey, Bill, Bill Johnson, my neighbor, why don't you buy a Liberty Bond? After all, my little Johnny is in France right now fighting for your freedom, risking his life and he needs bullets and he needs food. Are you gonna help my Johnny out? And it was like, geez, you know, how do you say no to that? You don't look very patriotic. This was especially used against German Americans to prove their loyalty, basically, as they would be called out in public. Hey, hey, Fritz, Horst, uh, are you going to buy one of these Liberty Bonds? Uh, you know, I haven't seen you do any of that. You know, we all know you're a loyal American, Fritz. But if you really want, you know, there's other people in town who don't know you so well to get off your case, maybe you should pony up the cash, 100 bucks, and you should buy a Liberty Bond. And this was done with great effect, tremendous effect. $33 billion raised doing this. Now, first of all, I love this poster. Now, I never made it to Boy Scouts. I was in Cub Scouts. I was Tiger Cub, and then I went through all the ranks. And after I finished the Weebelow level, they asked, do you want to go and continue on to Boy Scouts? My brother had 
dropped out at that point. He never got his Eagle Scout. I think he was up to life, which is just under Eagle. My older brother quit and I'm like, well, if my older brother quit, why do I want to do this anymore? So I quit as well. But I participated in a lot of these community activities and did this cool stuff. I had to learn the Scout Oath, the Scout Motto, etc. If you don't know the Scout Motto, it is very simple. It is be prepared. Now, the way I taught, I was taught that is when my father and Scoutmaster and everything would take us on camping trips. What they meant was bring chapstick because it gets dry in the desert. You know, when you go on a long hike, bring a canteen and a good pair of hiking boots, you know, an extra pair of socks. That's what I thought be prepared meant plan for the worst and have, you know, the materials that you need to, to avoid that catastrophe, right? In this picture, if you can't see it, this is a Boy Scout and he's holding a big sword emblazoned on it. It says, be prepared, the Boy Scout motto, and he's handing it to Lady Liberty, um, a rather masculine Lady Liberty there with a shield and she's been handing a sword, right? So it's literally like the Boy Scouts are handing the US Army the weapons it needs to go fight Germans. I never thought when I was a Cub Scout that be prepared meant hand me a sword so that I can chop a German person's head off, but perhaps that's what it means by this poster. I think it's an amazing poster. The posters would be there all over America, basically linking the Boy Scouts to this patriotic duty. And of course, mothers all over the country had their kids in Boy Scouts as they do today. And were a huge um, factor in, in winning this war. So, um, Uncle Sam now has this huge fund that it can now, more than any country on earth, and it can now spend it on contracts. And so we just flooded Europe with weapons and, and men and, and materiel for, for weapons. Um, other effects at home. So, so first of all, this overheated the economy. Everybody could find a job, right? No recession. In fact, there was a labor shortage, um, which I guess I might as well skip down to the bottom and cover this. A very interesting phenomenon happened in 1917, and that was that the economy was so good, we had a labor shortage. Um, we were spending money like crazy, hiring anybody, and immigration dropped off a cliff in 1914, right? Because as you might imagine, all these countries went to war in Europe in 1914, and they stopped issuing exit visas for their population. They said, you know, uh, sorry, you cannot leave Italy or Poland or you know Germany and go to the U.S. because the war has started and we need you at the front. And so immigration to America just dropped off a cliff. It would then surge again in like the two years or so after World War I, but in the middle of the war, nobody was coming to America. No one was allowed to come to America. And so Uncle Sam had to really look around and say, what sources of labor are we not really using so number one, that meant women. Women were going to go into the workforce in huge numbers and start working in these factories. So many men were being drafted and sent off, you know, 5 million men were either drafted or, or joined the army voluntarily and then sent out of the country. And that was less men to work at home. So women went in the workplace. Also African-Americans living in the South, living under the Jim Crow system, segregation, racism, discrimination, poll taxes, literacy tests, lynching, the sharecropping system, they were more than happy to leave the South. And before the attitude was, you cannot leave. If you try to leave and you owe your boss money under the sharecropping agreement, which nearly everyone did, the sheriff would hunt you down and bring you back and make you finish that contract, which meant basically you were going to work there for life. And now the attitude was, industrialists actually sent agents down to the South and said, hey, how would you like to come up Chicago and work in a factory? I'd love to, but I owe a hundred bucks to my boss. And without batting an eye, the industrial agent would pull money out of his wallet and say, here, we'll pay off your debt. Here's a first class ticket to come up. Now you got to pay us back, but we'll give you a nice interest rate and you can have, you know, you pay less like a, you know, three bucks a month for the next, you know, three years and you'll be out of debt and then you'll be in Chicago. You know, in Chicago, they have electricity in every single apartment up there. You'll have electric lighting. You don't have to light lamps anymore. You'll have a wooden floor instead of this dirt floor that you have now. You won't have, you know, leaks in the roof. Your kids will go to a school that will allow them to go until the 12th grade instead of dropping out of fourth, fifth or sixth grade to come work the fields with you. You know that they have refrigerators and washers and dryers and all these luxuries up north. And you can vote without any interference. 
So to millions of African Americans, this was a no brainer. Why not move up to Chicago or New York or Philadelphia or Cleveland or Pittsburgh and work in a war plant or a steel mill or anywhere? Uh, a lot of black women went north too because there was a huge need for domestic workers and many black women did those jobs um, because so many women went off to factories. There was this labor shortage. People still wanted their house servants and maids. And so they hired hundreds of thousands of black women to come and do that. So there was this huge exodus out of the South. Just in two years, between 1917 and 1919, 500,000 African-Americans moved up North. And once they did, their families would continue to follow them in the decades that, that followed. Most people thought, well, this will just be a couple of years. No, no, no. After you have black families in the North, they write to their families in Louisiana, South Carolina, Mississippi, Georgia, and they say, here's some money, pay off that contract and you come up as well. And there was this chain that really didn't stop until the 1970s, really. They, African-Americans continue in the 20s and 30s and 40s and, and so forth to continue to migrate. Now. White folks in the North were not that happy to see them. Um, there was violence, there were race riots, um, there was all kinds of tension over housing and what part, remember in the North, there's no official segregation. They don't actually say in the law, this is a black school, this is a white school. This is a white section of the beach at Lake Michigan, this is a black section. They didn't actually have those rules. Housing was segregated, but not by law, but by fact, essentially, sorry. Um, so, this would be like uh, housing units basically said, well, we won't re rent or sell to black families because it offends our white patrons and they're all gonna leave. This is known as white flight. Um, there's a saying in America that goes, there goes the neighborhood. And what that means and where those origins come from is right here, World War I, where a black family would move on, in on the block, maybe not even to your building, but you're looking out your kitchen window and there's a black family and packing their suitcases moving into that apartment. And you throw up your hands and you say, there goes the neighborhood. Now there's going to be crime and drugs and we better hightail it. We better move out of here. Or you do something really awful. Like you threaten them, you burn a cross in front of the building or you just out and out threaten them and say, we're going to kill you if you don't move. Um, and so African-Americans were really forced to live in certain sections of the city that whites didn't want to live in, right? You can live south of, of this particular street, right? What's amazing is in almost every American city, it becomes the South side. South side of Chicago, South side of Detroit, South central Los Angeles. There's only a handful of exceptions in all of uh, American urban life, which is really weird. Um, think of North Long Beach, right? That's an area that has many more people of color than Belmont Shore, right? Which is a very white neighborhood. It's very strange how that worked out. Um, so this changed America forever. There's now a large black population in the North that after World War I can vote, can serve in public office and can take advantages of all that the North has to offer. Wasn't perfect, but it was much better than the South. Um, as women moved into the factory and, and supported the war effort and raised money for the war effort, um, they got a lot of political clout. When the war ended and they're marching in the streets saying, we won the war for everybody, they can say that realistically. They did, they went into factories, they raised money. And so they could say, now we deserve the right to vote. And finally, America gave in. The South was the last corner of the country to allow it, but women are gonna gain the right to vote. Prohibition got a huge boon from the war. Now, prohibition, was a national ban on alcohol. But remember, this is a federal system. And so states had experimented with this before. Atlanta had banned alcohol in the early 1890s, um, which is why Coca-Cola took off, because it's a soft drink, right? If you can't drink beer, it was like, oh, here's something carbonated other than water that you know tastes really good. Um, and so lots of localities and, and even states, Oklahoma, the entire state had banned alcohol uh, during the progressive era. In 1919, about half of the United States had some form of a prohibition law. Immigrant areas in big cities typically did not, right? Connecticut, New York City, New Jersey, those were areas of Baltimore of, of a lot of immigrants, lots of Irish and Italian Catholics who said, no, we enjoy our alcohol. And so th that didn't pass there. And so here's what the Waspy Protestants and the WCTU and the Anti-Saloon League argued during World War I is number one, there's a grain shortage. Um, 
U.S. farmers uh, did very well in World War I. They made more money than they had ever made before just selling simple stuff like Brussels sprouts and broccoli, selling grain, selling corn. Now, there was, they didn't have good petrochemical fertilizers yet. That'll happen in the 1940s, uh, what's called the Green Revolution, which allows us to feed so many more people and produce so much more food otherwise. Um, farming techniques were very mechanized, but, but not, th there hadn't been that chemical revolution yet. And so there just wasn't enough land in America to produce enough food to feed everyone in America, Britain, France, Russia, and then when Germany surrendered, we had to feed the Germans too, because the British didn't stop the blockade until Germany signed the Treaty of Versailles in July or June of 1919. And so uh, it was felt that if you were drinking beer or whiskey, that was made from a grain that was produced and it wasn't going to the war effort. And so the WCTU and Anti-Saloon League had these wonderful propaganda posters that equated drinking alcohol with treason because every beer that you drink, that's grain that's not produced for our allies that we need to help. And you're literally working with the enemy when you do that. And that kind of propaganda works. People wanted to be patriotic and they didn't wanna be called out on that kind of stuff, right? Um, in a normal world, that, that would be what we would do about mass in public is that people would just call each other out and instead people are kind of proud not to have mass and stuff and it's become very politicized. But during World War I, you did not want to be on the wrong side of this issue. You didn't want to say, hey, I want to drink a beer. It's part of my German heritage. German, you say, well, that's the enemy. Along with the um, grain shortage argument was it was very easy to equate beer with being German. And the Germans were so vilified and so hated, they were considered to be barbarians, they hated freedom, everything culturally German was bad and was undemocratic, their music was undemocratic, their scientists were undemocratic, their language was undemocratic, and their food was undemocratic. And so it was very easy. All the beers in America had these crazy German names. A lot of these companies, I don't even know if they exist anymore, but in 1917, it was Pabst. I know they still exist, but Pabst, Schlitz, Blatz, um, Budweiser, Miller. I know Miller sounds like an English name. It's actually German. It was very easy to just point at that and say, look at that, these crazy German names. It's seeping into our culture. And it was almost like if you drink a beer, you'll start thinking like a German and you'll hate America and you'll be a traitor. So Germans are no longer proud to, to drink their beer. And Americans like waspy Protestants said, yeah, I'm on board with stopping drinking anything to help the country. Now, they told everyone this would be temporary. They said, you know, we're not going to have this ban forever. It'll just be during the war. As soon as the war is over, we don't need to conserve grain. Well, as soon as the war ended, the WCTU and Anti-Saloon League had these wonderful phony spreadsheets, statistics that said, look, the crime rate dropped during World War I. Isn't that incredible? It's because no one was drinking and getting drunk and committing crimes. When social scientists actually look into the data, what's very clear is that when you take 5 million young men and ship them out of the country, your crime rate's going to drop. Sorry, guys, I, I hate to say it, but if you are not aware of this, something like 90% of crime, not just in the US, but globally is committed by young men aged 13 to 25, basically. I don't know what it is, but young men in that age bracket do not think about long-term consequences, don't really care about you know uh, social norms and stuff, and they commit a lot of crimes. And so when you physically remove that many men from the country, your crime rate is naturally gonna go down right? It just happens. If you look at our prison population, it's majority men. It's majority men of color, but it's majority men, right? Is there are very few women in prison. And, 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 you know, all you ladies listening right now, you're like, yeah, because, you know, uh, boys go to Jupiter to get more stupider, right? Whatever those little phrases you use. Their boys are made of snips and snails and puppy dog tails. Whatever it is, that was the driving force of it, was just there were fewer men to commit those crimes. And so it was easy to sort of propagandize people and pass the 18th Amendment and eradicate alcohol. So it was a very weird side effect, but we get prohibition due to World War I. Um, 
Let's talk about labor unions. Now, there were two large labor unions at the time, the AFL, of course. The other one was this new one, the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. The best way to think about them is that they're pretty much the Knights of Labor 2.0. Instead of an anarchist labor union, they were a socialist labor union. And they had gotten very big in three key industries they absolutely dominated. One was the merchant marine. It's very dangerous jobs. These are sailors on merchant vessels, not in the Navy, but they pilot these ships across the oceans and onload and offload them. Very dangerous work. And those people were almost entirely in the IWW. Miners, so guys that do really dangerous work uh, going into coal mines and such. They were almost entirely in the IWW. And the lumberjacks, guys that chop down trees. Um, this was a hardcore left-wing labor union. Uh, it was referred to as the Wobblies. Um, that's what everybody called it. Uh, the way I always remember it is the, you know, the IWW was against World War I, right? It's like a palindrome of itself or whatever. Um, but that's the IWW. Um, now, when the war broke out, the AFL said, we support the war. The IWW said, we don't support this war. Out of all the countries that fought in World War I, the US left, so the, the socialist, anarchists, and communists in America were the only ones that were true to their philosophy and said, this is a BS war. This is a war of rich industrialists that are fighting to keep their interests and to keep their empire. Why on earth would poor Americans want to go and kill poor Germans when really poor Germans and poor Americans should turn their guns on the rich Germans and rich Americans that rule the world? Now, the socialists in France, the socialists in Germany, the, the Labour Party in Britain all said, yeah, but we're going to throw that out the window this time around, which was actually the smart choice because they cozied up to the government and they benefited from that. The American left said no, and they did some foolish stuff. Not only did they speak out against the war, but the IWW, the Wobblies, actually went on strike to prevent the war. This is really weird. They didn't go on strike to make better wages. When the war broke out, the IWW went on strike in Bisbee, Arizona. Bisbee's a little town in the south of Arizona that's a mining town. And they shut down the mines. They just said, we refuse to go to work until Woodrow Wilson gets us out of this war. Pretty ambitious there. All this really did was put a target on their back so that every townsperson could round them up uh, like a vigilante mob and do bad things to them. The way the Bisbee strike ended was the townsfolk rose up. This wasn't the Pinkertons or the government or the National Guard or anything. Just townsfolk rose up, went and illegally arrested the IWW members, put them on trains, escorted them into Mexico, and then told them to get off the train in the middle of the desert. They said, if you like revolution so much, go hang out with Pancho Villa. Bye-bye, comrades, and just left them there. And as you might imagine, the U.S. government did nothing to stop this. The newly founded FBI uh, silently applauded and said, yeah, we don't really need these people in this country. And then the U.S. government brought down the hammer on them. They lost their male privileges, which... Um, that was the way you organized before the internet or you know modern communications uh, telephones and stuff like that. If you're organizing a labor union, you have to use the U.S. mail to communicate across state lines. They lost that privilege. U.S. government said you're now you know a, a criminal organization. We're taking away your right to to mail across state lines. Uh, they were wiretapped. They were listened to. They were thrown in jail, and they were absolutely by 1919 the membership of the IWW was absolutely crushed. So. The effect of the war on the left was devastating. The effect on the center left, on the AFL, was wonderful. Never before had labor been so powerful. And here's why, here's the dynamics of this. Let's say you're in the AFL, which started to open itself up. They started to allow uh, white immigrants, they allowed African-Americans to join. They didn't open up to absolutely everybody, but they started to drop some of those restrictions because they knew the more membership they had, the more power they had. You're in the AFL, you're in a factory that's making gas masks during the war, and you know, as the head of your union, that production cannot stop even for a day because it'll obstruct the war effort, right? If you don't have men digging out steel out of, uh, uh, or digging out iron out of a mine or going into a steel mill and producing steel, if that doesn't get to the front, to the soldiers that need it, we may very well lose this war. So the government can't have a work stoppage. 
So the government passed these extraordinary war powers where the NWLB, the National War Labor Board, had the right to just end strikes, to just say, what do you want? What do you want? You get this, you get that. Now go back to work. And so labor unions really quickly realized they didn't even have to go on strike. They had to just threaten to go on strike. Like, hey, next week we're going to go on strike. I hope the government's listening. Someone from the NWLB would show up immediately. And they'd sit down with the president of the union and the president of the company and say, okay, what do you guys want? You want a 50% raise? Okay, boss, will you do that? No, that dips into my profits. What if we just raise the price of a tank and we just give you more money and then you pass it on to the workers? Sounds good. Okay, shake on it. Now go back to work, gentlemen. Now the AFL realizes they can just do this over and over and over. And they did. They went on strike thousands of times during World War I. They had more money, which gave them more wages, which gave them more dues in their union, which they then gave to both parties to try to you know, get politicians that were friendly to their needs. Never before had unions been as powerful in America. Now, this would all be undone in the 20s. By the time Franklin Roosevelt is president in 1933, union membership had dropped off a cliff. But during World War I, it was nice times for the AFL, not for the IWW. Um, now, what else do we want to talk about here? Let's talk a little bit about this anti-German sentiment, because it was pretty rampant. Um, it, it, incredibly, the CPI, the Committee on Public Information, they're telling you to buy bonds and join uh, the army, et cetera. And they're also sending out strong anti-German messages. There were big, big fear. And it's not just the Germans. We had, um, had Austria-Hungary as an enemy, and there were all kinds of people that had lived under that government. Uh, and there were big fears. Like, could we actually fight a war with millions of citizens of these former governments? Now, some of them were second or third generation. Most of them were not loyal to the old government. There, there were intense fears that 8 million Germans might not only not support the war, but they might be spies. And so there was propaganda all over the place vilifying anything German. Uh, I think I mentioned this to you guys in, in class earlier this week, but Americans had ab absorbed German culture. So many Germans had come in and brought cool stuff and we liked it, right? If you go to a baseball game, you think you're doing this very American thing. When you're eating a big chewy pretzel and eating a hot dog, and when your parents are drinking a beer, those are all German things. Those aren't things the British brought to America. Um, the, the Germans uh, brought beer to them. The first breweries that opened in America, the British drank ale, but I'm talking about lagers, the ones that you know are popular. Um, that was German. Uh, the hot dog is originally called the Frankfurter and Americans loved it and they put sauerkraut on their uh, Frankfurters. What else would you get at a ball game, right? The CPI it issued these lists and sent them out to schools, government agencies, libraries, businesses, and said, we recommend that you change the names of these certain things because we have to purge all Germanness out of our culture. We have to vilify them. We have to make Germans embarrassed that they're Germans. Teddy Roosevelt gave a very famous speech in 1917, and he said, there is no such thing as a hyphenated American. You can't be German American. You're either German or you're American. Pick a side. That was a former president and a rather popular one. And so German Americans were just sort of scared stiff. Um, German music was effectively banned. You could still listen to it, but it was, you know, you'd be very embarrassed to try to go and buy an album, you know, made by, uh, recorded, you know, uh, uh, Wagner's music uh, or Strauss. You wouldn't want to do that. Uh, these summer concerts in the park where people go out and listen to it, it used to be all Wagner and Strauss. And now it was like, no, John Philip Sousa. John Philip Sousa, more John Philip Sousa, and more John Philip Sousa. If you don't know John Philip Sousa, you obviously weren't in marching band. He did Stars and Stripes Forever. You're a grand old flag. He did all of these songs, very patriotic. Yankee Doodle Dandy was another one. Um, not Yankee Doodle, that was in the 1750s, Yankee Doodle Dandy. Um, in any case, everything German was just considered to be bad. A million German Americans changed their names during the war. My very close friend at Milliken, Mr. Fast, uh, went on Ancestry and discovered that his family actually came to America uh, in the 1850s as the Fausts, and they changed their names. When did they change their name? 1917. I wonder why, because it's just, they didn't want the hassle. P people knew you were German, right? 
But if you're white and you just change your name to John Fast, then nobody knows that you're actually German, that you have a very waspy sounding name. Uh, lots of people did that. Lots of men changed their name from Hans to John, from Fritz to Frank. Uh, a lot of them changed their last name, Schmidt to Smith, et cetera. They would, they would do this because they just want, didn't want the hassle. The census of 1910 recorded that there were 8 million German Americans. 10 years later in 1920, the census recorded only 7 million. Where did those 1 million go? Were they deported? Were they killed? No, they just stopped self-identifying. So there are today tens of millions of white folks in America that probably have no idea that they're German because they have this waspy sounding last name and their name's like Bill Jones or Fred Johnson or something like that. And they have no clue. They have absolutely no clue that they were German. They were sort of scared straight in that year. This, the towns and cities that were the absolute worst on this were the ones that had the most Germans in them. The uh, states that had the highest German ethnic composition were South Dakota and Nebraska. And both of those states passed the most restrictive laws, about uh, unreal laws, laws that said you could not speak German in public at all. It was a crime to speak the German language in public. You could only speak German in your own home with your family. If you spoke over the telephone to someone else, then it was a crime. If you spoke over your backyard fence to your neighbor, then it was a crime. If you did it out in public somewhere, it was a crime. Now, this was struck down later in the 1920s when these laws are challenged by the Supreme Court, but think of that. It's illegal to speak another language. Think about if we did go to war with Venezuela and the US government said it's illegal to speak Spanish in public. They'd have to lock up half of Los Angeles County. It's insane, but that's the way it was in America with ethnically German. They were the largest non-Anglo ethnic group in the country and they were just told, don't be you, don't be you. Don't eat your silly foods, don't speak your silly language, don't listen to your silly music, be proud to be American and be just like us. Several towns changed their names. Uh, there were hundreds, thousands of towns with the suffix Berg, B-U-R-G, that's a German suffix that means town. And it was changed usually to the French Ville, V-I-L-L-E. Lots of this was done. Um, just the, the paranoia was absolutely insane. Um, uh, as I said, hot dogs changed to Liberty Dogs. Um, sauerkraut changed to Liberty Cabbage in stores. The, all the names changed of this stuff. Um, even ironically, bizarrely, paradoxically, German measles, one of these terrible you know, child illnesses, was changed to American measles. This is something bad, right? Don't you want it to be foreign in German if you're really gonna propagandize people? No, 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 if I get sick, it better be an American version of measles, not this foreign one, not German measles. Crazy, but it was done. Um, the paranoia was just off the charts. It went away after the war and ironically in World War II, the propaganda is not like that at all. Propaganda in World War II was very careful to say German people are good, it's the Nazis that are bad. It's the government that's bad. It's the party that's bad. But German people themselves are good people. They want to be just like us. They're just Americans, right? They just have an awful leader. That's not the propaganda in 1917. It's these people are evil. They're Huns, they're barbarians, and they want to take over Western civilization. Moving on. I don't know if I'll have enough time to finish this. The slide is, is pretty lengthy. There's a lot in there. So let's see. Uh, I'll do my best. So the war ends. Woodrow Wilson goes to Europe in uh, early 1919, and he starts to hash out a treaty. By July, every country in Europe had signed on to the Treaty of Versailles, and every country agreed to it except the United States. We were the only country where the president didn't have the sole power to make a treaty. It had to be ratified by the Senate and the Senate never ratified the treaty. Treaty was rather bizarre. It's been very much maligned today as short-sighted and terrible, etc. It was probably the best that anyone was gonna get in 1919. And it was a weird conglomeration of vindictive revenge on the Germans that the British and French and Italians wanted and very lofty, wonderful goals that Woodrow Wilson was able to, to wedge into it as well. So on the one hand, you had these horrible punitive things to the Germans, like it said, the Germans were going to have to pay reparations to the British and the French. And, and it's rather extraordinary. But as the payment plan was set up originally, the Germans were going to have to pay huge sums of money to the British and French 
until 1964. Had World War II not intervened, they would have been paying for that long. Huge reparations. They had to sign the war guilt clause that said the war was all their fault, which it was not. The Germans do share a disproportionate amount of the blame for World War I, but they were not by any means the only ones driving Europe to the brink of war in 1914. That was ridiculous, but they had to humiliate themselves and agree to that. They had to keep their army under 100,000 soldiers. They had to keep their navy under a certain amount. I forget how many ships, but they couldn't have it. They could not have an air force at all. They could not move their soldiers west of the Rhine River in the western part of their country. Quite literally, they're told, you cannot move soldiers in this part of your own country. It will be occupied by the French for all eternity on German soil. Um, and all your colonies are going to be stripped from you, and we are going to take them and sort of divide them up between the British and the French and the Japanese. And so that's in the treaty, but there's also these wonderful things like Woodrow Wilson made his 14 points for peace. America was one of the actual grown-ups at the table here that said, we don't want anything. We don't want any money. We don't want any of that. We do want our money back that we loaned to Britain and France, but we're not gonna force the Germans to pay. We didn't loan them money, they surrendered. We're gonna rebuild them as an ally, we'd like to. Um, but we instead would like self-determination right? Like all these areas in Eastern Europe that had not been independent before, they should be independent now. One weird side effect of World War I was the Russian Revolution and then Austria-Hungary split apart. And all these new nations, Finland had not existed ever before. Poland had not been independent in hundreds of years. Czechoslovakia, all of these countries broke free of Austria-Hungary, declared their independence. And Wilson said, we should absolutely honor that independence and give them a seat at the table we should have freedom of the seas. That means no unrestricted submarine warfare, right? That, that countries can trade freely and you can have a blockade, but it has to be a gentlemanly thing where you warn people before you shoot at them. Um, you are going to have um, um, open covenants and uh, a League of Nations. What that means is no secret treaties anymore. It's very hard to predict what your enemies will do if you go to war with them when you don't know what agreements they have with other people. That means every treaty signed should be shown to the world at the League of Nations, which brings us to our most important point here, which is there should be a League of Nations, an international body that internationalizes democracy. Democracies have a lot of stability because people don't use violence because even when they lose elections, they realize, well, if we use violence now, we'll probably lose and go to prison. But if we just wait four years, we might take power legitimately. And so that gives everyone an incentive to be peaceful. What if you could get what you wanted from the League of Nations rather than going to war? What if you have a disagreement with France, you're Germany, you have a disagreement, you take it to the League of Nations and you settle it peacefully. Wonderful idea. This is why Woodrow Wilson is held high. A lot of historians have looked back and said he was racist, he did all these horrible things, which is all true. But he's usually held as a near great president. He's usually like, you know, in the top 10 or so, mostly because of World War I, because he said when the war was over, we should try to make an international peace. His ideas really come into fruition after World War II with the United Nations. The League of Nations could not prevent World War II and it, it was a failure. It was largely a failure because the US never joined it. And the Europeans kept a lot of people out of it, like Germany and, you know, Soviet Union. So, um, Everyone signed on to this bizarre treaty except the US. Wilson then went to the Senate, asked them to sign it, ratify it, and they refused to. And then he then went on a, a, a tour of the US, a, what was called a whistle stop tour, where you get on a train, a caboose of a train, and you go to all 48 states and you speechify and you give speech after speech after speech, trying to convince the American people to call their senators, send a letter to their senators, send a telegram to their senators, and get them to change their vote on this. Which uh, brings us right into the awful nature of 1919. I know I went over this with the progressive era, but I want to touch it again just to show you as bad as this year was, we go through these cycles in American history. 1919 was the most disruptive year in American history since 1865, since the Civil War. And uh, 2020, it's weird, you know, these years that repeat, you know, their digits, 1919 and 2020 are, are pretty awful years, right? 1919, here's everything that happened. First, you had this treaty fight. You had 
Wilson basically going from state to state saying, don't let these Republican senators reject this treaty, because if you do, your son will have died in vain. Right, nearly 200,000 Americans died in World War I, and almost everybody had a family member who had died. And it, it was a very cynical ploy he did, but he said, your son, your brother, your uncle, whoever it was that died, will have died in vain if we don't sign this treaty, because this will allow us to prevent wars so no other young boys go off and die. This is the war to end all wars. The Republicans flipped it on Wilson and said, no, 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 if we sign this treaty, we're gonna be forced to keep troops in Europe forever. They're gonna be in a war in two years. You know, those Europeans, they're just gonna be killing each other for centuries. We wanna have the flexibility to opt out of future wars and the League of Nations doesn't allow us to do that. It basically forces us to come to the defense of any European country, which was true. Now, Wilson's point was that will be a deterrent. No one will invade anyone else if they know they have a war with America, which is true today. Europe's very peaceful because we have bases in every country in Europe. No one would think to attack anyone else. But the Republicans at the time very much feared that it wouldn't stop Germany or France or whoever. Um, so the treaty became very controversial. It was rejected and there were these ugly fights about it. Wilson was so stressed out over it, he had a stroke and nearly died. And that was a very disruptive thing. Second, as I said, a half a million African-Americans moved to the North and white folks were not happy to see them and this caused tension and riot and violence all over the North. There were a wave of riots in the summer of 1919. Chicago had one, East St. Louis had one, Philadelphia had one, Harlem had one. Every major Northern city did. The black population of a, a lot of these cities it not only doubles, but in some cases triples, quadruples. In Detroit, it quintupled. It went up by a factor of five. I want you to note this, if you're unaware of this today, Detroit is the most African-American city in the United States. It's 80, 85% black today. There was a time when it was one of the whitest cities in America. Before World War I, there was hardly any black folks that lived in Detroit. After World War I, there was a sizable black population in Detroit and it would only grow over time. And white folks got very upset at that. They didn't wanna live near black people. They didn't want their kids to go to school with black people. They didn't want to mingle in public at parks and beaches with black people. And so violence broke out. Whenever black people would go into the white side of town, there would be a scuffle that would then erupt into days, if not weeks of rioting. The worst one of all was in T Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, not 1919, but sort of a lingering after effect of that. And it was scary. It was really worrisome. Much like we debated these protests that some of which turned uh, violent last summer with the Black Lives Matter protest, these ones very much disturbed people. The, the racial uh, uh, animosity that existed in, in American Northern cities. So you have that. Second, strikes. There were over 3000 strikes in 1919. This is because when the war ended, the government shut off all those contracts. They stopped borrowing, they stopped spending. And that meant that if you worked at a mask factory making gas masks, you don't have a job anymore. Or they cut back your hours or they cut back your wages. And so the AFL went on strike and went on strike and went on strike and went on strike. And it was very disruptive. Factory workers went on strike, miners went on strike, steel mill workers went on strike, lumberjacks went on strike. And the craziest one of all, the Boston Police Department went on strike in 1919, causing a lot of animosity between the WASPy Protestants of Massachusetts and the basically all Irish Catholic police force. So it comes to the top, not only labor strife, but ethnic as well, which it almost always did in America. Whenever there was a strike, there's often two ethnicities on, uh, on the opposite sides. So that was incredibly troublesome. We didn't have really any strikes this year in 2020. We had a bad economy for sure, but unions are practically dead in America. You had a lot of pretty violent labor strikes in that year, over 3000. Next you had um, the Red Scare. You had a revolution in Russia that really energized the far left. The far left had been saying since 1848 that capitalism was doomed to destruction. It was all gonna fall apart. It was a house of cards. It was just a matter of time. And with Russia going into revolution, it didn't seem all that crazy to say so. This was the most right-wing reactionary government and it became a very left-wing government. The Bolsheviks took power in Moscow. This sent shockwaves through the world, and especially in Europe. In America, we certainly didn't like this new government, the Bolsheviks, but they were far away from us. They weren't much of a threat. 
But the feeling was we have a lot of Russian people in our country, right? Millions of them. Are they going to be communist and, and want a revolution here too? Um, and some of them did, and I don't blame them. Uh, these people that were leaving Russia, like uh, Jewish people leaving czarist Russia, they hated their government. They knew how awful it was. And no one quite knew yet that the Bolsheviks would be as bad as they were. So there was hope that at least the anti-Semitism and the violence against Jewish communities and the pogroms would stop. And so many Jews in America said, you know, the Bolsheviks aren't so bad. That terrified liberal America. Uh, there were Italians in New York City were going out marching with hammers and sickles on saying, you know, we, we have solidarity with the Bolsheviks. So there was an immense crackdown. There was this very famous case that would come up, the case of Sacco and Vanzetti. The evidence was very flimsy against them, but they were anarchists and they kind of rubbed it in everybody's faces at their trial that they were just being picked on because they were immigrants and because they were anarchists. And, you know, don't worry, the revolution is coming soon. And that terrified people. They were sentenced to die in the electric chair on very flimsy evidence. I, I think I mentioned in a lecture before that the LA Times was bombed. Wall Street was bombed. The attorney general's house was bombed by these sort of far left organizations trying to create enough havoc and chaos that there'd be a revolution. So there was just terrorism all over the place in America and it's absolutely sent conservative middle America into an absolute frenzy, just petrified that there were communists and anarchists and socialists under the bed and in the closet and everywhere. And we had just been too generous and let too many foreigners into the country in the last 40 years. And we didn't know what to do exactly, but huge fears, big crackdown. You see this cartoon, um, thousands, thousands of American residents were shipped out of the country. If you had not naturalized yet, and you were walking around waving hammers and sickles, et cetera, the government would arrest you and then deport you to your country of origin. So thousands of, of American residents were just deported during this time period. You like communism so much, go live in Russia. Okay. And there, there were a lot of people that had immigrated from Russia and were saying, you know, kind of left-wing stuff and they were kicked out of the country. Lots of them. Lots of them were sentenced to long, long prison sentences. Eugene Debs, the leader of the Socialist Party and Socialist Labor Union in America, was arrested for merely giving a speech, a rather boring one. He wasn't saying, let's have a revolution. He was like, hey, you know, workers aren't paid enough. He was arrested, thrown in jail, and sentenced to life in prison for simply saying that World War I was a mistake and workers aren't treated very well. That's all he really said. Now, he would be pardoned by Warren Harding in 1921, but he sat in prison for four years and he was serving a life sentence just for talking. The anti-German sentiment created a lot of paranoia and anger and strife in America during this time period. Um, we had, of course, a pandemic that year, a worse one than the one we're dealing with now, right? This one now is horrible. 400,000 people have died from COVID. The pandemic of 1918, 1919 killed about, we think, nearly 700,000, 675,000. Now, that's more victims in a country that's bigger right, or a country that's smaller, excuse me, we're a much bigger country today. There was probably only about 115 million Americans back then, which is only about a third the size it is now. So you'd have to multiply that 700,000 by a factor of three, bringing it up to about 2 million. It would be like a pandemic today killing 2 million people, which is just extraordinary. It disrupted a lot in America, a lot, and it killed mostly young, healthy people, which was weird. Um, this was because it created this bizarre effect with your immune system where it would generate an overreaction in a strong immune system and the strong immune system would attack lungs and heart and you would die of lung failure or heart failure because your immune system was causing inflammation. COVID actually works kind of similarly or, or sometimes it can. Um, so this was a terrible thing that happened as well. Um, and I'm trying to think before we get to the 1919 Black Sox scandal, if, if that's it, but all of this was happening in 1919, and it was a very, very disruptive year. Um, and so you also have the Black Sox scandal. Remember the Chicago White Sox took bribes through the World Series. That This remains the biggest scandal in all of sports, the World Series. Imagine today, because I don't think this could ever happen again. Imagine today that it comes out that Tom Brady or LeBron James was taking bribes and deliberately lost a championship game. It would be a huge scandal. And I would say impossible because 
<laughs> those athlete salaries are so high. Now, what, what could you bribe LeBron James with that he doesn't have with uh, already? The guy makes hundreds of millions of dollars a year, right? And endorsements and everything else. Athletes were paid very poorly back then, so it was easier to bribe them. I, I, LeBron wants titles. He doesn't want money. He's already got all the money in the world. Same thing with Tom Brady, right? This would be a huge scandal today, an enormous one. We do have a lot of scandals in sports. I mean, they, it's gotten pretty bad. But this was an age of innocence. People thought athletes played for the love of the game. Baseball was the pure American sport, and it was corrupted from within. And unfortunately, it was done so by a gangster and gambler who had an identifiably Jewish name, Arnold Rothstein. And so it allowed Americans to sort of paint Jewish Americans with the broad brush and say they're not loyal, they don't love the country, all they care about is money, all these horrible anti-Semitic stereotypes. And so Americans just said, that's enough. This is such a disruptive year. We can't have this anymore. And they voted the next year for the first time in a long time for the Republican Party for a conservative that said, let's return to normalcy. Let's go to a calm America where we don't have immigration really anymore. We've let enough immigrants in. We need to shut the door and assimilate people. We need to um, raise the tariffs back up. We need to not join the League of Nations. And so going into the 20s, the US very much sort of wrapped itself in a cocoon and turned its back on Europe. Didn't join the League of Nations, set the highest tariffs in the world so we wouldn't trade with them. Um, set up these neutrality acts so we couldn't loan money or invest uh, in European nations that were at war anymore, um, which explains why when World War II broke out, we couldn't do anything to help out the British and French because we had laws preventing us from doing it. No immigrate immigration was slowed down to an absolute trickle. Hardly anybody could get in in the 1920s. Um, and so 1919 had a lot of ramifications politically. Uh, people who had soft spots in their hearts uh, for immigrants 20 years before and loved Teddy Roosevelt and wanted regulation. And unions were now saying, Immigrants are blowing things up. There's race riots in my community. Baseball's been ruined. Uh, these foreigners have germs and they got us sick, which wasn't true. The Spanish flu did not originate in Spain. It probably originated in Kansas. But people just blame foreigners for all of this and they just turn their back on Europe. So going into the 20s, we have Warren Harding taking us in a very different direction. We'll get to the 20s later. But uh, that's World War I, folks. I guess that was about an hour and a half, not too bad. So answer those questions. Um, we finally got to World War I, saving the world and killing the Germans, and we did it. There's going to be a sequel in a couple of uh, weeks here. We'll get to World War II. All right, ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful day. I will see you later. Bye-bye.